Welcome back to Let's Code Live. So we are continuing with Ruby today, and as uh, if you were watching last time, we just finished with uh, some kind of iteration stuff. So for example, we have this 30 dot times uh, do block, right? And uh, we are going to be starting on a project, a mini project in, in Code Academy called Redacted. I believe, if memory serves me, this might have been the, the last project that we got to last year. Uh, before I got extra swamped. Okay, so what we're building is basically something so we can kind of read through the code here. So we've got some text uh, we're gonna grab off of standard in, uh, we're gonna grab more text off of standard in, and then we're going to split all the words out into, into this, uh, or sorry, we're going to make a list basically of words by splitting white space. And then effectively, if the word is equal to the word that we're trying to redact, uh, we will, um, sorry, if it's not equal to, then we'll just print the word and append a string onto the end of it. Pretty, pretty typical. Otherwise we'll put redacted in. Uh, so if we run this and we say, you know, test this word, word, and then we say maybe this, then we will get that redacted out of it. Um, it's this, it, it could be pointed out that this algorithm isn't necessarily the best way of doing this. I mean, it's not terrible, but um, the, it, it does teach, I mean, all, obviously all kind of programming like lessons like this one here, right? Their intention is to, you should be looking at their deeper meaning and not necessarily that this is the way that you should handle this kind of a problem because there's, um, there's various reasons why this might not work well. For example, if the word that you're trying to redact um, has a S after it maybe, or a, a plural or an apostrophe is possession or something like that, um, then this method won't work uh, where something like a regex search and replace like we did for the denth meaneth war or whatever one earlier. Um, it was actually a somewhat similar problem um, and in theory would, would be solved in a very similar way. So we'll hit next here. All right, so we're going to puts or put string out and we're going to say, you know, give me some text. And hopefully, hopefully that gets us green. We'll see. Oh, oh, wait, hold on. Now we need to get. Uh, so we'll say text equals gets dot chomp, which again trims off white space from both sides, especially the new line that you enter when you press the actual return key. So when we run this uh, test and hit return, maybe we'll get green. Oh, oh, and redact. Oh, we're doing the for the top bit. Okay. No, oh, not text. Uh, redact. I'm gonna guess that it's testing the existence of these variables, text and redact. Okay. We'll run here. Test, test, and we're green. All right. So split or explode or, you know, various other ones that, that you've, you've heard from different languages and stuff, very common. Effectively, it's a way to take a string and operate on that string such that you end up with an array of pieces. And the pieces are effectively what's on either side of some kind of a boundary. So in this case, it's called the delimiter. Great, that's great. So then this, for this one, it would be comma, like a comma separated text and we'd split like this. And uh, in our case, we're gonna be splitting with the space. Um, you should just, you know, I mean, again, I don't wanna go necessarily always down tangents, but if you're doing some kind of comma separated value uh, or really any sort of split like this in general, uh, you need to be worried about the existence of whatever you're splitting on being inside of your target on purpose. So for example, in the case of a comma or a comma separated text, let's say we have like, um, like name um, and like age or something like that, or like description. And then uh, we would do like Jared comma test or something like that, right? And that's perfectly fine, but what if it's what if it's uh, other and malicious string, right? Then in theory, 
you know, we'll either end up with more columns than we thought for this particular line. So we'd first explain, split all this by new lines, and then we would explode these out by commas. And then in theory, this one either gives us way more data than we want, or it gives us data in the wrong position than we want and things like that. So you have to have a way of, of escaping a string like this. And oftentimes that is done through maybe having like a backslash in front of the character or something like that. But just keep that in mind when you're using split, uh, it's pretty common to have, you, you, you oftentimes need to think about the kind of scenarios where you're using split and what you're splitting might actually be in the text that you're trying to split. Um, actually, in my example, I said that we would have already split the whole block of text by the new line characters to get us every single row. And that obviously may not, uh, may not work out. Uh, <laughs> because... Uh, what if somebody put a new line character in one of the text fields, right? So uh, that's, that's called like marshalling or sanitization, stuff like that in general. So we'll let's say words equals text dot split and we'll put in an empty character and we will, do we need to do anything else? Uh, it doesn't look like it, so we'll hit run. And we only have one word, so like words isn't gonna be a, a particularly interesting list. Okay, so now we're going to use the dot each on a list. So, for example, we, we expect words to be a list, even if it's an empty list. And we would say uh, words dot each do word or something like that. And, okay, and then in theory we can print out each word. Okay, print word. Now, in theory, we would print word plus a plus a space because we lost all of our spaces if we say uh, one two and x uh, we'll get one two all combined together so in theory we want a space but we'll, we'll deal with little implementation details like that in a little bit so now we're going to have some if else blocks so add if else so we can do it either way that we want so for example we can say let's say unless, which is our, our less common if, so unless uh, word equals redacted, redact, then we will print word plus space, and then else we will print word, or sorry, print redacted, and end. Look at that. Look at that. Code, Code Academy text editor just, just handles that white space so cleanly. All right, so if we say one, two, three, and we say two, then we get one redacted three. In a lot of ways, we're basically done. Oh yeah, it looks like we are basically done. So that's, that's great. All right, so we're gonna say next. All right, so we're learning about data structures and specifically arrays and a new data structure called hash, which is also um, also called a map sometimes or a dictionary. Hash map, I guess, technically. Uh, and dictionaries are usually implemented as hash maps. <laughs> Not always, but they can, they, they usually are. Uh, so declare my array and we'll hit run. Oh, sorry, equals something. Equal to an array of your choice. We'll say one, two, that's good enough. Okay, so array access by index, which is what we're seeing here. Um, this is pretty common syntax in most languages that if you have a variable, for example, demo array, and we want to get the uh, first element, for example, we would index the array as at zero. Now the reason that is is because historically um, arrays are effectively just like aligned data types that have an offset. So for example, if you were to make a array uh, of integers in C or something like that, then the platform specific integer concept defines how kind of big things are. So you, you would effectively, you'd either stack allocate an array of a fixed size or you'd heap allocate using uh, one of the memory allocators and you'd memory allocate 
basically the size that you want your array to be times however big, however many bytes the, uh, the, the specific piece of data you're trying to store in the array is, in this case, like let's say it's an integer and it's 32 bits, then if you wanted, for example, uh, or sorry, four bytes. So if you wanted, for example, you know, to store like four of those, then you'd allocate 16 bytes. And then every time you'd say, you know, I want to assign the first integer to be this, you'd be uh, pointing to a location in memory and saying for the first one, it's offset by zero. So it's literally the memory address right there. And for the second one, the index would be one and you would just offset in memory by the size of your type. So your integer type, you'd, you'd go four bytes into the future and that would be basically the, uh, the first one. That's number one why in, uh, arrays are indexed by zero, uh, meaning that they start at zero and don't start at one. And uh, as, long as, as long as you're aware of that concept and you kind of use it multiple times and stuff like that, it's really not hard to, to keep in your head. So, it's, it's very similar to the, the concept of like inclusive versus exclusive for, for counting and things like that. So when you're writing a for loop, you want it to happen exactly 50 times. Like, do you start at one and then say greater than equal to or less than equal to the 50? Or do you start at zero and say less than 50, et cetera? Once you get kind of some muscle memory built up around the, those concepts, then array index by zero is really not a concern at all. So now we're going to say that we'll say demo array and we want to get the third value which is index two so we'll say two and that will be 300. so we can say string array equals and in this case we would say uh make an array and then we will say make an array of strings on two and that's that there you might be wondering actually how would you how does the memory concept or memory model that i just described how would that reference um something that's not fixed like this right because this the let's say three is now suddenly more characters long than the other one ah well the reason for that or the way that we get around that is that strings classically are actually just once again basically arrays of a set size and typically that size is one byte or one car and uh, effectively if you were to write this in C you'd be defining an array of type car star basically saying that you are gonna have your array is going to point to a memory location where every every member of that array is going to be itself a pointer to another memory location. So you can think of a string as basically just being some hypothetical part of memory that's that represents that string, then a, a string variable is basically just going to be pointing to that piece of memory, which means that you can make an array of strings by just point having an array of pointers to the strings themselves in a um, language like Ruby and Python and stuff, all of those details are abstracted away. And in fact, you can, uh, you can put multiple types inside of an array and it doesn't really care what, what type it is. And the reason that it doesn't care is because they're really all the same type, meaning that these are object-oriented languages. So it doesn't matter if it's a string or if it's an integer or whatever. Effectively, you're making lists of pointers all the time. So uh, in C, you could do the same thing by just defining your, your array as of type like void star or something like that. And then uh, meaning it's just an arbitrary pointer. There are arbitrary pointers inside of them, uh, the list rather. But then you'd have to cast. Every time you unpacked it, you'd have to do some kind of introspection to tell what the type is and then, then cast it to that type. Uh, arrays of arrays. So in this case, we have um, we have nested arrays inside of them, and we can actually kind of use white space to clean this up and make it readable. Because in general, we want our programs to be readable. So I would write it like that or like this, um, and this gives you some structure to it to make it obvious that we have an outer scope array here. And then we have four members inside of it, which each have four members and they're just zeros inside of it. 
so what do we got here? We have for every instance or for every member of the multi-D array, uh, we will put out X, which in, in this case is basically just one of these rows. And so it's going to form out a row, right? So what we're going to see is basically this part, but probably without, I mean, definitely without commas. It's just going to be effectively these, these ones, just like that. So we'll say my 2D array equals list, and we'll put um, stuff in it like one, two, and you know, oops, something like that, right? And we'll hit run, and there we go. Okay, so a hash, uh, and in this case, we're going to, I'm, I'm not entirely sure if, if uh, calling this a hash is, is interesting, uh, but that's an, that's an implementation kind of specification around the concept of what's actually a dictionary. So in English, a dictionary, well, in a, pretty much any language, right, a dictionary is effectively a mapping of a definition to the word itself. So they are effectively indexed or ordered by the word. So you can say, you know, if my word begins with an I, I jump to the I's, I start looking down, you know, I, I do whatever kind of binary search you perform in your head when you're, when you're looking up a value like that out of a uh, ordered list of, of, um, of words. And then once you find your word, um, you've effectively discovered the meaning of the word by the value. So in this case, we have effectively a dictionary where we have the keys are uh, strings, name, age, hungry, and then the values or the definition for at those keys are Eric 26 and true. That is the concept of a dictionary. Uh, they're calling this hash. And what that means is that it's behind the scenes, it's implemented as a hash map. Uh, which means that effectively the keys are hashed and then um, the the values are basically stored at the hash um, like address, if you will. That's because we can't necessarily, we don't, we wouldn't want to, when we instantiate a new dictionary, when we create a di an object that is a dictionary, or in this case a hash, uh, we uh, you always have to make some kind of choice, possibly heuristic uh, or based on current data, uh, but you have to make some kind of choice like um, how big to initialize it to. And uh, HashMap gives us a good way of doing that and allowing us to, to grow that uh, fairly easily. Um, the one downside to HashMap is what happens on collision. So if, for example, uh, we only have three slots in our dictionary and... Um, multiple, we, we have, we try to fit a whole bunch of data into that dictionary, then there's going to be a lot of collisions. And effectively, every time there's a collision, um, it's just going to require more work for your implementation to either grow in size or to resolve that collision by um, putting the, the putting it in the next slide is usually how it works. So for example, if you have a dictionary that is you know 10 10 slots big or something like that we'll just think of these lines here and your hash and your your random hash function or your um kind of pretty random looking hash function uh you know you come in with name and it hashes and it says that's in slots you know six no problem we'll put eric there uh and then when it hits age and it hashes that and maybe it gets three and it's no problem we'll put 26 there and then if it hashes hungry question mark and it happens to also get a six it'll discover that there's already a value saved there. And um, one of the common ways to resolve that is to just look at the next slot down and see if that one is uh, occupied or not. And if not, then put it down there. Um, basically comparing the, uh, or, or, or kind of growing, grow, not growing it really, just making it so that you have to do more comparisons to, uh, to do that anyway. So uh, a hash, in this case, ha a hash is a function that takes some kind of input and gives out a fixed size output that is either cryptographically unique or at least unique enough in the scope of whatever kind of paradigm you're working on, in this case, like storing three values into, into memory, right? 
uh, and this is technically speaking a dictionary. It should be described as a dictionary. Uh, the hash part is the implementation, is how the dictionary is implemented. Because obviously um, you could implement this a variety of ways um, and a hash is just a, good, a pretty good way of doing it. Okay, that is to say that uh, they're very common. Um, every, every language has, has something like this um, with potentially the exception of some of the lower level languages like C. And they're almost always in um, kind of accessed just like arrays, meaning that if we have a variable and you go into it and say uh, the key X or, or name or something like that, uh, very, very common to do it that way. So what we're going to do is do hash.new, which is hash is the class new, will give us a new instance of it. So we'll say my hash equals hash.new. And my hash, use hash to create a new hash called oh, pets. All right, so once again here we have, we have our square bracket notation to, to index into it. So we'll say, uh, add a pet to your pets hash, okay? Uh, we'll say pets. Blondie equals, and what was, what's our value? Oh, I guess our value in this case is the type, so that'd be a tarantula. Uh, see? Good. All right, so accessing hash values, no surprise here. It's basically the opposite of storing one, so we can put pets blondie. Okay, so we have some iteration. So for example, we have, in this case, we have friends and uh, we have family. Both of uh, the friends is a, is a list. So when we call each, we only use one um, argument or free variable here. And then the hash map here, when we call each on it, we actually get back the key and then the value into different value or two different um, <coughs> local variables. So when we say run this, we'll have the first four lines or so coming from the dictionary, and then we have the next uh, bit here. I'm sorry, this this one super long string caught me off guard. Um, we have that bit here down here. So uh, also, uh, this is uh, in, in at least in some ways basically the opposite of the way most people use things like this. Usually the key is something that is generic and the value is something specific. Usually, not always. So I, a lot of times you would see this particular concept reversed. So it's a little weird to see it this way. So you'd have dad is Homer, mom is Marge. Uh, it's, a, it's a little strange to see them backwards. Use that each to put out each element of the race so we can say languages that each and then we did this earlier today but we're going to start a do block and we're going to pipe use the little pipey symbols to get a variable we'll call lang and then we'll end this with ends and we will puts puts out each lang on their, their own line effectively what puts does right the magic of puts compared to print uh, so we can iterate over a multi-dimensional array, which means we would do dot each inside of dot each. So puts on every element inside the subarray inside of S. Okay, so we will say for sub, or sorry, uh, we're gonna say S dot each uh, do pipe, and we'll call this sub and end. And then inside of here, we'll say sub dot each do and then we'll say ingredient I guess I probably didn't spell that right but since I don't have a spell checker in here I'll just copy it because it doesn't matter and then we'll put out ingredient and we get green there and doing it over hashes so we'll say secret identities 
dot each. And then in this case, we'll say do, and then we'll pipe in two. So we'll say um, hero and man, maybe. Although man is, man's not good, right? It's 2018 here. ID maybe. And so we'll say puts, how do they want it formatted? Separated by a colon and a space. So we will puts string and we'll use the pound brace uh, version of string interpolation, do hero and then space colon space and then pound braces for ID. So far, so, oh. I'm wondering if maybe we don't want a space before it. That's better. All right, so multidimensional arrays. Let's do what we got to do. My array is just a multidimensional array. So again, white space um, makes it more readable. So I'm going to separate it out at least one per per array. And obviously. Um, well, not obviously, I guess, but let's say that you had on two, three. Um, if, if you think that you're going to be adding to this list commonly, uh, then you should probably put these, these on their own lines too, like so. And then commonly, as long as the language supports it, I would recommend always adding what's called a trailing comma as well. Uh, that allows you the trailing comma Man, the white space in here. Okay, that's better visually indented for me. I don't know if this is Ruby convention here. Oop. Okay, so uh, the reason for this is that if you're using any kind of um, source control, uh, like Git, for example, uh, usually when you make a commit or you you save kind of files into the repository, that's done through some kind of diff, and uh, if you had a string like this, and then you added commas four like that. Every time you do that, you're actually going to have you're going to be diffing two lines because you will have taken away the line that ended with three without a comma, and then you're going to add the line with three and a comma and the line for four, and it just makes it a little messier. When if you if you especially if you know that you're going to be changing this list, you know in the future, um, try to always add the trailing comma. Uh, and you'll note that you can add the trailing commas to the array itself as well. So we can say All right, so now we'll create hash. Feel free to use either hash literal notation or hash new. So we will say uh, the literal notation, by the way, is the same that you would see in JavaScript and, uh, um, well, actually, it's more similar to what you would see in uh, PHP, actually, because of the uh, equal greater than symbol being used to kind of define something. Uh, is you, in JavaScript, that's usually, that's a colon. In PHP or in Python, it's a colon. In PHP, it's the same the same thing here. So we will create a my hash hash, and we'll use the oops equal, and we'll use the literal syntax. And then inside of that, we will do some kind of key. So we'll say key, and we will assign that to value, and then we can re rinse and repeat key two, and value to actually can it just be value again it doesn't really make any difference uh, you wouldn't want it to be key and then key again though because it's kind of redefining it. it's actually interesting to see what would come out right puts my hash at key two just or let's do do key and we'll run this and we have value no huge surprise what happens if we do this Ooh, key is duplicated. So it actually raises a runtime exception. Um, so we're going to review iterating over hash. So we have this lunch order here and we can say uh, lunch 
order dot each do pipe. And inside there we'll put, I guess, um, name order. And inside of the here we'll put out each, just the value, not the key. So it puts the order because that's the value, not the key. Um, this could be better organized for what it's worth as something like this. Etc. On the on down, right? Make if we're if we're gonna have uh, well, I guess technically a lunch order seems like a single single object anyway, so this isn't so bad. But if you uh, if you wanted to kind of do any sort of analytics on this, for example, you wanted to see, uh, let's say you have a whole bunch of of lunch orders over time. Uh, if you pack them in like this, then you can do all kinds of stuff on them. Like you could, for example, map them by names so that you basically just get by name every order they've ever done, or even maybe the distinct orders that they've made to try to analyze, you know, frequency or analyze um, uniqueness or something like that. Uh, so uh, kind of restructuring the data in this way makes sense in some cases. Uh, also, this is the way that your data would come structured if you got it got it out of or stored it in a database, right? Because in a database, you have a table and you have columns that are always um, specific to the table, but generic across the rows. So, for example, in this, if we had a table called like lunch orders or something, there'd probably be some kind of numeric primary key, and then there'd be columns for things like name or order or something like that, and. Uh, uh, this this is how you, when you fetch it out of the database, you'd actually probably fetch a structure that looks quite a bit like this, or at least after after it's done by uh, being kind of put into Ruby Ruby esque notation here. Okay, so create a histogram. Let's see how fast we can do this because I do have to get moving on for the day. But let's see if we can bang out the histogram. Ah, yes, we're counting words. Perfect, right? Pretty easy. So we've got some text. We're going to grab the text. Actually, let's just we'll just hit run, and then uh, we're going to move on because we want to actually do it, not necessarily just read read it through. So we're going to put a statement to prompt the user for input. So puts, and we'll um, I actually need to grab a piece of text, maybe like cuphead cupcake ism, and we'll just do a short paragraph. Okay. So we will put uh, text, please. And then we will get, uh, or sorry, we'll say text equals gets dot chomp. And that's all we're doing, so we'll run. And I'm gonna get this into my uh, clipboard so I can paste it over and over. Okay, so now we're gonna split probably by the space again, right? So we're gonna say words equals text dot split. And to that, we're going to pass a space. And do we need to do anything? Just declare. So now we're going to start making a hash map kind of frequencies things. So we'll define a hash map called frequencies. I'll just use the literal syntax, but I won't actually define any of them. Oh, sorry, default value. Can we do a default value? Create a hash map in the editor, give it a default value of zero. This makes no sense because a hash map doesn't have a value except for at keys. So we could iterate over them and fill them, but I'm not sure what the idea, what the intent here was here. So did you create a hash map with the default value of zero? I guess, uh, oh, sorry, if, if you use the constructor like this, uh, you're you're basically doing a default dictionary or something. So we'll do hash new and then we'll give it zero. Sorry. So that um, if it's not if it doesn't exist, instead of getting a key error, you'll get 
uh, a zero back. Which is very common. You have the same thing in some other languages as well. Although not all of them. I don't think you can do a default dictionary in PHP, at least not um, classic PHP. All right, so we're gonna do words.each do pipe word and and inside of that we're going to increment everything by one so we're going to say frequencies at word and you'll, you'll note that this isn't in quotations at all because instead of using a string literal which is what you make when you do something like this here you're basically making a string literal that says text please Instead of doing that, we're making a uh, we're we're peeking into the dictionary based on what we just split, and then we'll use the plus equal one notation to basically store in the dictionary the a new value. And because of this default nature here, we won't get any sort of errors or undefined behavior. We'll just have a histogram. Now we need to print it obviously if we actually want to see it. Oh, we want to sort it first. So we're going to use sort by uh, which is so for example we'll say frequencies uh, equals frequencies dot sort by do and then uh, we're gonna pipe in the key and value but realistically it's word and count and and inside of this we're going to just put uh, count. Uh, use reverse exclamation point. So we'll do sort by do, okay, frequencies dot reverse exclamation point, which we could have also done by just doing frequencies equals frequencies dot reverse and run Okay, I was off by one on one of those. Not too bad. Run, oops, run. And then we'll iterate over it. So we'll say frequencies dot each do pipe word count and, and inside of it, we need to see how they want it formatted. Uh, puts the word single space in the frequency. So we're going to puts word plus space plus count. Oops. Fair enough. Let's use string interpolation instead. So we'll do this part. And then we will do well, pound brace, brace, pound brace, brace. Uh, I believe it's like 2s or 2 stir or something like that as a method to convert um, a number type. Ooh, what? Uh, maybe this only works with double quotes. Uh, that's how it works in PHP too, so it's not a huge surprise, meaning that uh, in PHP or in potentially Ruby, indeed. So in Ruby and PHP, double quotes uh, allows you to uh, part, well, the, the Ruby interpreter will parse that string liter literal for indications that you want to do interpolation. Uh, if you use single, single apostrophes, uh, quotation, single quotes, uh, then you don't and that actually does imply in a lot of ways that it's faster So that's nice um, One slight problem here, which you might have noticed and you should probably try to fix on your own is that uh, Words that end with dot aka sentence ending words are always tracked as their own uniqueness unless that word happened to end a sentence more than once but some of these words likely appear more than one, although I can't tell by just looking, although it actually doesn't look like they do, but something to keep in mind. So we'll hit next here and we did it. So 
if you enjoy content like this, please please like or or comment or chat and tell your story. You know, I love reading comments. I'm always answering uh, questions if people have them. And until next time, keep coding.